Tonight, it is all about the law. We will start with a sexual abuse case against a former high school drama teacher at Horace Greeley in Chappaqua. The attorney representing some of the former students, he joins us on set. Then, Melania Trump is threatening to sue several news outlets over claims they have made about her past as well as her immigration status. We're going to ask our legal panel whether, in fact, she has a case. Also, it does sound medieval, but it is happening now. How debtors' prisons have made a comeback. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. We'll get into those conversations, plus my one-on-one -on -one with the Washington Post Supreme Court reporter talking about what the possible new makeup of the Supreme Court, depending on the elections, may be and how it could impact huge seismic cases. We'll get into all that. But we begin first at Greeley, where, where we're getting new details about sexual abuse case involving a former teacher. Court documents say the high school knew, possibly as early as 2011, that Christopher Schroffnagel was accused of sexually abusing students. One of those documents quotes an anonymous student's mother saying the following, quote, I understand that rather than referring those allegations to the police department, that the Chappaqua Central School District chose to keep it quiet and do their own investigation. No actions were taken against Mr. Schroffnagel between 2011 and 2015. Now that teacher taught there for 12 years before getting suspended last summer amid the accusations. He resigned in September and he was arrested soon thereafter. He pleaded guilty to three counts of child endangerment and admitted two of those cases involved sexual contact with minors. Now, Hearts Greeley is not the only school dealing with problems like this. You've seen these stories splash across headlines before. Horace Mann, a lead private school in the Bronx, embroiled in a sex abuse scandal that went back decades. Bergen Catholic High School in Oradell, New Jersey, just reached a nearly $2 million settlement with 21 former students who alleged abuse. And there are many cases beyond our region, again, dealing with this issue. But this case in particular does not go back decades. This is the here and now. And joining us to discuss this is David Englesher. He's the attorney representing former students in the Greeley civil case. And he's kind enough to give us a few minutes. And as always, some of the familiar faces on Wednesday night, Jimmy Kasuris and Mayo Bartlett. They're also here. Jim, as you know, criminal defense attorney in Manhattan, sitting on the board of directors of the New York City Criminal Bar Associations, frequently lecturing at New York Law School, Bar Associations, Queens, New York City, and Birmingham, England. Mayo is an attorney at the law offices of Mayo Bartlett PLC, former chief of the Bias Crimes Unit at the Westchester County DA's office. Gentlemen, thank you. And David, I'll start with you. Hello, Richard. When we see this story, and again, I'll treat it from the aspect of a parent on the outside, um, the skin crawls, where you entrust an adult um, not to be the parent, but in this case, drama, and you learn thereafter allegedly horrible things happened in the classroom and now not just allegedly because he has pled guilty to some of these claims walk through us from the families and obviously protecting confidence and everything else what you learned um, and what is not beyond a shadow of a doubt to this point that even the court has acknowledged then we'll get into what's the proper punishment and where we go from here well firstly Richard thank you for this opportunity you know my kids have been silent and I speak for them, I speak for their parents, and this is an opportunity for me to get their message across. You mentioned something about skin crawling. I happen to reread some testimony of my, one of my kids, and I call them my kids and my moms, and I read it and I shuddered. The stuff that these kids went through is unbelievable. When did the school know it? We believe they knew it even before 2011. We have some information to believe that it's, it goes even further back. Um, you also mentioned something too. There's, there's some Latin words called id loco parentis, and what that basically means is people or parents give their children to the school, and then the school must watch those kids as if they were the parent. So when this all came out, the parents felt betrayed, they felt deceived. I'm giving you my children for five, six hours in a day and you're allowing them to be given, you're, you're allowing a teacher to give them drugs, you're allowing a teacher to give them alcohol, you're allowing a teacher to fondle them and grope them. That's not a reasonable parent. When we say children, we're talking 15 year old, some case younger potentially, right? 14, 15 when it started and went for years. And that's the other interesting thing here, Richard, is this is not one episode where a teacher abuses a student or flirts with a student and then goes out and with that student 
once and there's a, there's a problem. This is a concerted effort by this teacher year after year after year after year. And thank heavens, by the way, for the kid who came forward in June of 2015. Because if he didn't, you and I wouldn't be here. One of my other clients who was being groomed to be the next victim would be that next victim. And then the kids who I do represent and the other two who've started civil cases would be having these demons swirling in their heads and not being able to get it out, not being able to get recourse. And that's something, too. I'm here, one, to help get my clients compensation. But more importantly, I'm here to make sure this doesn't happen again. I want to shine a light on the school district and say, this is what you did wrong. Don't ever let it happen and again. And I want to get to the school district both how they handled this and then also some of the outstanding questions even to this day. But first, let's deal with the teacher in question. Um, to the outside, at least, there were serious charges uh, that were filed. But he will not spend a day behind bars. He will not have to register as a sex offender. Now, I know the judge, when presented the deal from the district attorney's office, um, wants additional information and isn't altogether comfortable if, if you listen at least to some of the questions posed with the arrangement. Now, I understand some of the victims didn't want to have to testify in open court. Uh, there was even a consideration or a care from some of the kids about the health of the teacher in question uh, because I guess he had suffered from cancer and was having multiple procedures. I'm sorry. I'm the parent of one of these kids. This guy, forget about, you know, registering a sex offender. He deserves to be behind bars. It seems extremely lenient. Before we even get to the sex offender status, kid puts his hands on minors. That's sex abuse by any definition. How is that not a crime punishable by jail time? Well, firstly, kudos to Judge Krause. I was there the day that, that this plea arrangement or agreement was announced, and I just thought he was going to rubber stamp it. But kudos to the judge to say, wait a second, I have to review this. I need to know more about this. And in the interim, people have written letters to him, and they under and now he understands that there are a bunch of victims out there that maybe he didn't know about. So kudos to him for not just getting a disposition on his docket and saying, Shh, that's one case gone. But as I understand it, David, he, his consideration was the sex offender status. Get to the issue, is it, is it fairly represented that the families didn't want to go through the public court or ordeal for this for the kids and they're willing to not have them spend any jail time? Is that fairly representation as the papers the, have said? The, the answer is yes. And I was in court when the prosecutor and the district attorney said that in open court that the parents and the children don't want to have to go through further testimony. But the judge has said to them, I want to speak to those kids myself. I want to hear what they have to say. The jail time, I could, I could see, understand. What I don't understand is the lack of sex offender registration. That's got to be. Why not the jail time? Explain that to me because, uh, again, I think everybody puts themselves in the case of the parents where they didn't find out about this. We'll get to the school and how they handled it more appropriately, mishandled all of this from the beginning. But nonetheless, this teacher clearly groped, uh, groomed these kids. He plied them with alcohol. He plied them with cases with drugs. He groped these kids that is a punishable offense regardless of his health status. That might be a different consideration. But even from what he pled guilty to, it seems to me that's criminal. That necessitates some form of jail time. The answer is under the misdemeanor charges that, that he has agreed to accept there is a chance of jail. I think the judge is concerned that he knows that if he says, you got to go to jail, teacher, notice I don't call him mm -hmm. by his name, you got to go to jail, teacher, the teacher's going to say, I'm not going to accept the plea because you don't want to be a pedophile in prison. And I think he doesn't want to go to prison. So if the judge says you've got to go to jail, he'll say, you know what, make those kids testify. But I also believe that if he says you have to register as a sex offender, but you don't have to go to jail, he may accept the plea. So there's a lot of balls in the air here, and I think these guys will know better than me. But it's, it's what will this defendant accept? Mm -hmm. well, Richard, yes. one of the things is that if you're pleading guilty to endangering the welfare of a child, uh, that, that charge in and of itself does not permit a person to be registered as a sex offender. So that's a statutory guideline there. So that's not something you can agree to absent uh, legal uh, requirement. Let me be the statute. layman here, which I am, so I can play that on TV. Right. But, but to me, endangering the welfare of the child, you offer a kid a drink, that's one thing. But there's an acknowledgment there was improper touching. 
Um, and it goes beyond that. I'm being charitable for this conversation. That's more than endangering the welfare of a well, child. That's statutory rape. But that's forcible touching. 18, it's, isn't it's not it? statutory rape because statutory rape requires more than simply forcible touching, touching a person inappropriately. So you're looking at whether there was actually penetration, all kinds of things. And again, uh, you, you do have to sit down and say to these parents, and the parents have to think about it, and the kids have to think about it, is this something that you're comfortable moving forward with and having that mm. explored, even for the judge? And I've known Judge Krause for a long time, respect him tremendously, uh, but the children are not required to speak to him. So at some point, you're right, if, if this uh, offer is rejected, which the judge can do, then the alternatives are, do you indict, or do you possibly seek mm. a, a change or, in venue? Or you know? do you have him plead to an offense that requires registration. Obviously, these plea negotiations involve not having to register as a sex offender. If you plead to a crime that requires sex offender registration, there's no way around it. Which the judge there's seems no to imply it. from his words here that That's right. you just pled to something that by definition, but through the New York State statute does. And I want to- not, but judge, I, I will say this, if it requires it, then you have to do it. The lowest you can be is level one. But the right. only other thing that the state is, even if you plead to endangering the welfare of a minor, there's nothing that prevents probation from applying sex offender conditions. Which is different than the SORA, the Sex right. uh, Registration Act, uh, conditions, and that's what the parents are concerned with. He can move to Massachusetts. Well, mm -hmm. not necessarily. They have to permit him. If you're on probation in New York State, in Westchester County, in order to leave the county, you need permission from your probation officer. So if you go to Putnam or Rockland, yeah. that's a separate uh, guys, violation. I want to get to okay. the second part, which is the school now. Now, we can, uh, there'll be debate, there'll be, uh, I, I'm sure, uh, on the civil side, what the school knew and what they didn't know. However, the school did a couple things here that not that I'm playing to, to the choir, but in June, uh, June 30th, in fact, less than two months ago, lawyers for the school um, filed to the reply of the civil lawsuit. They alleged that the students, the 14 and 15 <laughs> year olds that are suing the district were quote, negligent and reckless in their behavior. A 14, now here's what I don't get guys. The school should want this for all obvious reasons, not to drag out any more than it does. To blame the victim for being ne negligent and reckless to a pedophile who's grooming them? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I, I haven't said this out loud to, to too many people, but very early on in this case, I reached out to the attorney for the school, and I said to him, my clients are willing to do a confidential mediation They'll sign an agreement of confidentiality. Let's get this closed. Let's let my clients put it behind them. Let the school district put it behind them. Let the school district change its ways. And guess what? He, that no one ever called me. So my hand is forced. I've got to go forward. I have statutes of limitations running. I have clients that want to know what's going on with their case. And what's amazing to me is how much traction the story gained when they blamed the students, when you blame a 15-year-old, even if one of my clients did something untoward towards this teacher, the teacher should have said, that's not appropriate. I'm going to call your mother. When one of my clients went to the teacher and said, you know, I have a little bit of a drug problem. Can you help me out? And the teacher says, that's all you did? I did a whole lot more than that. He glorified drugs. That's a problem. But the school district had their opportunity. I held out the olive branch to them. And instead of calling me back, they said, no thanks. David, go back, in, I'm sorry if I go, go back in time a little bit. Before this a ever became a court case, when the school got a whiff that there was a problem here, whether it was before 2011, 2011 that's now being alleged, or certainly even more recently, what did they do or not do as it relates to informing the parents? Because there's a part of this that when people were reaching out for more information, the school told all the parents, don't talk to the media. In effect, keep this all quiet. When did this, did the school properly notify parents that they might have a problem on their hands here, that their kids might have been subjected to something that was really untoward, let alone bringing the, the local police department? I'll give you an example. One of my kids had excessive cutting of class and the parents went with him to school and the school said it's not us it must be you so did they do the right thing blame the victim it's never the right thing so no did the school know about it I believe they did I have some stuff that 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 sheds some light on that but there's something called constructive notice and these guys know what I'm talking about it's 
the condition existed for a sufficient period of time that it should, should have been fixed. Been. There were clues, and I'm not going to go into them with you now, but there were multiple clues that this teacher was a problem. And David, if the parents, if your parents were aware that this had been going on for as long as it had been going on, those children are probably removed from the home now and the parents are charged. So that's something that we have to look at. There's virtually no consequence for the school district here. And, Isn't and that interesting, by the, the way? The message that needs to be sent, because we have seen this time and time again as you've talked about the other schools. Schools are not going to police themselves, whether it's an elite school that gets $50,000 a year per student or whether it's a school in a district where it's going to affect home prices and so on and so forth. And the bottom line, as difficult as it is, is twofold. Parents need to be ever vi vigilant, to be looking at their kids, asking their kids questions because, you know something, the kids have to go to the police because as hard as it is, the bottom line is when you go to the school, often you're going to get these internal investigations that are kept quiet, they go nowhere, and now you have damaged children. You have to go straight to the police and for time who purposes, are going to I act I only have on time it. for one more question, sure. and that is how are the kids now? Damaged, damaged forever, dealing with it, dealing with changing their lives in every aspect. I have one kid who said to me, I can't go to a party anymore. There's alcohol, there might be drugs. I have to change my life. Um, Long-term relationships. Here's a man who said, you're a great actor. You're a great actor. Watch how this guy acts. And the only reason why he was saying that was to have his way with this kid. And now, when they find out that you really weren't meaning that I was a good actor, you're saying it so you can have your way, they felt deceived and betrayed. Lack of trust. You bet. Yeah. Forever. For the rest of their lives. So you think about all of our relationships where we are, are, are based on trust. Our spouses, our friends, our coworkers. These guys now forever will be damaged by this. And it's a shame. It's a real shame. Obviously outstanding questions here where this uh, goes on the criminal side and certainly on the civil side what we'll uh, learn. But uh, David, uh, I certainly hope you keep us surprised of it. Thank you so much for giving us a few minutes tonight. Anytime. Thank Lockdowns. you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Coming up next everyone, Melania Trump, Hulk Hogan, and the broader question of free speech. Even the stuff we don't like. Where's the line start and stop? We'll get into that after this.